Hi, I'm Matt from Ludovox and today we are at the second day of the Essen Spielmesse with Alex, the designer of the board, uh, Dark Souls board game. Hi Alex. Hello. So, uh, did you enjoy the, the show on your first day? It was very busy. Very, very busy. But yes, I did enjoy it. We can imagine and uh, Dark Souls has gathered uh, an immense uh, support from the players uh, for... Um, well, it was well known in the history of Kickstarter and... Um, so, it's a game for how many players? Uh, one to four. So, I guess that if we can play with one player, it's going to be cooperative, right? Correct. It is a cooperative game. You are playing against the board. So, can you tell us the basic history of Dark Souls for those who have been living under a rock? Uh, so, it's a video game. Uh, it's a well known as a very hard video game. Uh, when we came to the board game, we wanted to focus on the fact that we wanted to keep it fair. I mean, Dark Souls is never unfair. It's hard, but if you die, you usually did something wrong. So the focus was making sure that we kept that there. So you're never getting screwed over by the game. It, you've usually done something wrong. Okay, and um, what is the object of the game? How do we enjoy in Jolly Cooperation? Uh, so as you're going through, you want to be fighting against the bosses. To get to the bosses, you have to kill the grunts through exploration to get treasure. And then you get the treasure, you get better, then you can go and kill the bosses. You're basically going through, the way that we set up the core game is, you kill a mini boss, and then you go through to a new bonfire, then you explore through, you kill a main boss, and then if you've got one of the expansions, you can go on to a mega boss from there, or you can call it there. Alternatively, we are working on a campaign, which is more of a like slow grow version of the core game. So as you're going through, you can maintain your progress, you don't need to start like a new character, and just keep progressing up and up and up. Um, and we're setting that up so that you can try and get some run-throughs to repli uh, replicate the actual video game run. So if you want to play the board game like you would Dark Souls 1, where you start off against an asylum demon and work your way through, assuming you have the models you need, you can do that. So uh, if you die, do you respawn at bonfires, like in the game? So when you die, you go back to a bonfire. One thing we do have is a lose condition. Obviously, you can't lose in Dark Souls. It's basically as long as you can last without throwing your pad at a wall and breaking it. But in a board game, we need tension. If there's no tension, you're losing a lot of what Dark Souls brings. Um, so the bonfire is limited on sparks. Sparks are essentially your lives. And once you've used them all, the bonfire goes out. You've got nowhere to go back to. You've lost. Sure. So um, what do we do in a player's turn? So here we have a boss fight, which is the, the dancer of the Boreal Valley a very infamous uh, boss from Dark Souls 3. So, um, how do we fight the boss? Um, so, as you're going through, you have pieces of equipment, which you can see down here. They have, have offensive stats on them, which are shown here and here. Um, they cost stamina to make attacks. Your stamina is your resource that starts here, and it zigzags up. When you get hit by the boss, you take damage, which zigzags down. When they meet, you've died. Um, everything costs stamina, so you're moving, we've got node based here, so as you're moving it will be costing stamina every time you move. Your attacks will also cost stamina, as you can see on the cards here, some of them cost zero, some of them cost three. Uh, and the core loop of the game is, as you're going through and dealing damage to the boss, they are getting closer to what we call the heat up. The heat up is basically like a second phase, and when you hit that, all the rules change, uh, things get added, things get shuffled, and it's focused around like memory mechanics. If you can remember what order things are coming in, you can start to be more aggressive with your three stamina attacks because you know you're safe, because you know where the next attack is coming in. When they heat up, that deck gets shuffled. So your order is forgotten, and then maybe you have to sort of back off a bit, wait to see what's going on, and go from there. And that's sort of the core, core loop of the game. So, uh, all of the characters take one action, then the boss takes one action, right? It's, it's alternate activation, so in a, in a standard fight, the enemies always go first. So she would go first, then one of the player characters would go first, then she would go again, then another one would go, and so on, so forth, in that loop. So, uh, can we explain one of the cards, uh, for example, this one, or maybe the, the hit-up card? We can do both. So, the uppercut card here, this shows that she would move forward twice, moving forward twice that way. 
The circle here shows that you'd be targeting someone. Targeting is done first on proximity. So if you are closest, she will come for you. Then we also have aggro mechanics, which you gain when you end an activation. If you're an equal distance apart, she'll go for the person with aggro. Um, so this one here shows she'd target. Both of the player characters are on the same node and they're both directly ahead. So she would simply move two nodes forward over to here. This icon here shows that she would push people. So if anybody was in the way, they would be pushed out of the way. Um, and that's the movement portion of her, her attack done, or her behavior done. We then move on to the attack part. So this shows that it is a range of one. A range of one would be any node that is adjacent to her here. And she would hit for five damage. The cross swords with the shield shows that it's a physical attack. Um, there is nobody in range to be hit, so no one would be hit by it. And the red part on this arc pattern below it shows that she would be weak. And she would be weak on the right hand side. And when you attack an enemy in the weak arc, you gain additional dice when you're hitting them. So it basically shows that they've made a big swing somewhere and they are now vulnerable for attack somewhere. Uh, so they left an open area. So how do we damage the, uh, the dancer? Uh, how do we roll dice? So if we say, for example, that she's done this behavior, she's moved up to here, we'd then choose one of our player characters to go first. Um, we'll say that the, the herald would go first. So the herald's first movement would be free. Your first movement is always free. So if we say that the herald moves to here, that one is free. I could then move to here. This one would cost one stamina. So we'd mark one stamina. At this point, I'm standing within the weak arc. These three nodes are all in the right arc. So I would now choose which attack I would like to make. Um, if we say we're going to go for the three stamina attack, which is the big attack from the Herald, we then generate our dice pool that's shown on the card. So for the Herald, it is one black dice plus one. And the plus one shows that you would add one to your dice roll, which in the case of the dancer who has one armor, would just ignore her armor. Because I'm in the weak arc, I also gain an additional black dice. I would then roll these. I have done two damage. I would then mark that here. She has 34 health. So that's what I need to get rid of to beat her. But in doing so, I've left myself vulnerable. Every time I'm spending stamina, I'm losing health. It, the more I spend, the more I lose. Um, you can only attack once with each piece of equipment. So in terms of the build we've got the warrior with, the warrior has a shield that also has an attack on it. So the warrior could do a hit with the axe and then a hit with the shield, do more damage, but obviously that's costing more stamina. So um, I see that the armor is also a card, a movable card, and uh, the shields probably work like uh, the shields of the dancer and the bosses and the mobs. But um, does it hinder the characters if you have heavier armor or do you have special stats for the armor? So the way that works is all of the defensive stats for the player characters are seen along the bottom of the card. The one on the far right is how many upgrade slots it has. So that's the only one that isn't a defensive stat. Here, this is the physical block. Next one along is the magic resistance. And the, finally, you've got dodge. So the first one is your physical block, and you basically add those up along, and that is the amount of dice you have. So for example, on the block here, we've got one black from this armor piece and one black from the shield. So if I got hit, for example, by this five damage attack, I would roll these. I roll a total of three. I subtract my three from the five. I would take two damage. So that's just mitigation. Works exactly the same on the magic resistance, but if it was a magical attack, you would then roll that. And finally, we've got dodge. So the warrior has two dodge here, and we have two dodge dice. This number here is known as your dodge value, and I would need to roll two successes to avoid that. The herald only has one dodge, so the herald would be unable to dodge that because the armor that he's wearing is too heavy, doesn't have enough dodge on it to be able to do it. Uh, would you spend stamina to dodge? Dodging does cost one stamina, but whether you are successful or fail that dodge, you get to move one node. So that's to replicate the iframes that you get in the video game. When you dodge, sometimes you still take damage because you didn't get the timing right. So we've replicated that by it costs one stamina to do so. You always get to move, but it's the risk of if you miss it, you're basically taking whatever damage you would be taking. So in this case, five plus another one because it's cost me a stamina. So essentially that hit, if I fail that dodge, I've taken six damage. Um, so uh, the dancer has several moves and patterns that we can have. 
and you told me that uh, when it builds up like this, it fires up and you add this new card. So can you explain what it does? Uh, so this card here is what we call a heat up card. In the full game, there will be three of them that come with the dancer and you would take one out of those three. Uh, this one in particular, she would move forward, which would push. Uh, however, you'll notice it doesn't have the targeting one, so she would just move in the direction she's facing, which in this case would be straight down here. We'd push this model here, and he could go either here or here. So we'll pop him over here. She would then hit any arc. This, this icon here shows that she's hitting an area, and the area is shown on the arc diagram again. So we can see that it's the front, left, and right arc that are getting hit, which would be our warrior. So our warrior would get hit by that, she would then make a 180 degree turn. And then this icon here shows that she does it again. So she would then walk back up here, hit the same arcs again, which would then hit the Herald, turn around. And at that point, that, that uh, behavior is resolved. But she has a special rule that means every time that card is resolved, we shuffle the deck again. So the whole game's based on a memory mechanic. If you can hold off and remember the order, you can then see when you can take advantage of her weak points and where you are safe, and then go a bit more aggressive with your stamina spending because you know you don't need to be able to take more damage. Um, once she's heated up, she becomes much more unpredictable, but that is just a rule separate to her. All of the bosses tend to have their own heat up rules to make them feel like the bosses from the video games. And probably their own gameplay as well, so the dancer is all about unpre unpredictability, Probably, um, I don't know, um, let's imagine uh, Lorien and Lothric, um, they must be like uh, very powerful but uh, weak if you separate them or something. I don't know. Tell me. A lot of the ones, so the example we've got of when you're facing two bosses at once is Ornstein and Smell. And a big thing with those is just managing your resources very carefully. There's two of them activating at the same time. Whereas on the behavior cards for here, we've just got the one ability because we've only got the dancer. For them, while they're together, they have an ability for Ornstein at the top and Smau at the bottom, and they activate together. But they heat up not when one of them hits a specific amount of health, but when one of them dies. Um, so if you're, say, you're focusing on Smau, and then someone goes and starts hitting Ornstein, they're wasting stamina. Because when Smau dies and Ornstein heats up, he goes back to full health and then gets, rather than having one or two cards that go into the deck, it swaps out for an entirely new deck for just him. So there are many different things we've put in. And we've tried to focus on the flavor of the fight. So with Ornstein and Smau, it's very much trying to focus your damage, manage your resources. So we've tried to replicate that in that fight. This one, as you say, is all about it being unpredictable. So we've tried to match that. And we've tried to do that in every fight to keep it so that all the fights have an individual flavor uh, that makes them feel like the boss is doing the video games. So uh, when do you plan to ship the, kick the Kickstarter? Is it um, in production yet? Uh, as far as I'm aware, it is in production. I'm possibly the wrong person to ask for that, but I believe it is. Uh, in terms of design work, we're on target for the April 2017 launch that we announced during the Kickstarter. And um, how come did you design a Dark Souls game. Um, I mean, we know that uh, Sony and From Software are selling, for example, uh, we have Bloodborne uh, with Eric Lang and we have you with Dark Souls. So these are very different companies. So um, did you have the idea of the Dark Souls board games prior to, um, let's say, selling a prototype? Or what's the story of the game as the designer? Uh, so one of our directors, Matt Hart, used to work in the video games industry. He had a friend that he knew that was working at Bandai Namco from when he was there. They'd gone to, I believe it's called an IP fair, so where you can go and you can look at intellectual properties and see if there's anything you'd like to inquire about. Um, he was talking to the chap that he knew there, um, and we knew we wanted to make a dungeon crawler. Um, we really liked the AI mechanic, um, and we didn't know necessarily whether we wanted to go with our own IP for it or if there was something there. And after Matt had this chat, it just felt like a good fit. We wanted to make a dungeon crawler. They wanted a Dark Souls board game. And it just happened from there. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, I think we've got everything that we need to know about Dark Souls, the board game. Bye-bye. See you on Ludovox and praise the sun.
blessing. Yeah.